Hello again. Last time I designed increment and decrement support for my register file. This time, well, let me explain. I'll be honest, the past week or so has not been productive on this project. Other commitments have meant I've only had minimal time to spend on electronics. What time I have had has been spent hunting down bugs. I'll begin with what went well. I started with the even registers and widened the increment decrement support along with some new drivers for the data input to the register file. Everything worked flawlessly. Well, except that I swapped the bit order on my GAL design to make wiring a bit easier. This was the first GAL design mistake. Then I wired up the odd registers. Here I realised a flaw in my design for the 16-bit address increment. I'll explain that later. After a fix, it all looked very promising. I then tested the odd registers. Increment decrement produced somewhat strange numbers looking like certain bits on the input weren't wired up. It took me a while to work out that some of the GAL's pins weren't making contact with the connectors in the breadboard, no matter how many times I tried to reseat it. I really should have spotted that this was going to happen. Back in my third episode, I commented that I had to push down on a chip to make sure it was seated properly. Well, I should have thrown that breadboard out the window at that point. I then took the last breadboard from my box which is a slightly better design, and tried that. But of course, it has different lugs to join it to other breadboards, so it didn't stay still, and the slightest movement knocked something on the boards, making all registers suddenly latch whatever garbage was on the data input bus. What a lot of frustration. So, I ordered new breadboards, they arrived, and I had some success with those. I really didn't think I'd be able to get to this point. As before, I've got MicroPython on the Pico with a helper script. It simulates clock cycles. The script leaves the clock high, that is, the first half of the clock cycle is elongated until I send the next command. I have two modes. The fast mode runs with no delay, whereas the slow mode pauses between the parts of the clock cycles so that I can debug what's happening. To start off, let's fill all registers with hex ff to check that all bits are wired up. Now I'm going to show all the values. So we have the data being displayed here for all eight registers. And then we have the address displayed here for all four register pairs. That's good. Now let's fill them with different values. This will check that I haven't crossed any bits over. Again, data is displayed here. This looks correct. And address is displayed here. Excellent. So now I'm going to try incrementing. So check that they all work as are expected. I'll increment each of them in turn. There we go. And I will now show all values. You can see they've all been incremented. Now I'm going to repeat the same, but this time I'm going to decrement them all. And they should have returned back to their original values. Yes, that appears correct. And now let's try incrementing addresses. I'll set register pair 0 and 1 to an address hex 45 FE. So I must set register 0 to the low byte, which is FE. And I'll set register 1 to the high byte, which is 45. And now I will just output this address, which is displayed correctly. I will now increment this address. Read it again. It's 45FF, that's correct. Increment it once more. And it's 4600. So that's correct. So in the case where it didn't carry, it did not increment the odd register. And where it did carry from the even register, it did increment the odd register. So that's working perfectly. Finally, I'll increment it 1000 times. 
So my prediction is that it was on hex 4600. I'm going to add a thousand to it. So we should get 49E8. So let's write this. There we go. I'll go back to slow mode, otherwise we won't be able to see the result. There you go, 49E8. It's working perfectly. Given that that all works, I'll talk about what I had to fix. Let me quickly explain the first flaw in my design as I left it last episode. I had said that the gal for the odd registers only needed to support incrementing and not decrementing, because for register pairs, I only support incrementing. Well, I had neglected to follow through the increment and decrement for an odd register. I guess I thought that I'd wire it through the same chip as the even registers. When considering how to wire this up on the breadboard, I realised that it wasn't going to work. Instead, I decided to have one identical gal for each side. Then, when I increment a register pair, I can let the odd side perform an increment, but only latch the result into the register if carry from even is set. The next flaw was that I had wanted the inputs to the register file to be somewhat neat, as though it were a clean API in some computer program. In reality, I ended up having to decode too many things on the register file side. I decided to move that responsibility to the decoder unit. A nice little side effect is that I can rely on a registered output of the decoder. I don't have to worry about the time taken for combinatorial logic, and all inputs will arrive with the same propagation delay, more or less. I'll run through the new set of inputs. As before, I have 8 bits of data input. I said last time that I needed drivers on the input to split the even and odd buses so that I can do a 16-bit increment. That's why there's a data input enable here. I noticed that I only used the low bit of the register selection to choose which side to read or write. I decided therefore to drop this bit, only use bits 1 and 2, and then split the inputs to control whether to read or write for each of even and odd. This is what I mean by performing decoding of the inputs. If this latch enable for even is set, the value on the internal even data bus is latched at the end of the clock cycle. It's almost the same for the odd side. However, there's an additional input that controls whether to pay attention to the output of the even incrementer. If I'm writing a value to a register, or incrementing a register, this value is 0. If I'm performing a 16-bit increment, it'll be 1. I'll show the one OR gauge that I need for this in the schematics. There's a clock signal used to trigger actions at the right point, and here ID stands for increment decrement. I sort of got the power down mode working on the gals. Initially, this was going to both enable the chips and enable their output to the internal data buses, but it's currently just wired up to the output enable. And then there's a choice of direction of the increment and decrement. Just as I had to split the latching inputs for even and odd registers, I split the output enable. Address enable will always read a register pair, so there's no need to split this one. And then some new inputs for flags. I've designed but not implemented the flags register. The register itself will be in the register file. The ALU will need to write new values. There's no negative flag input, as this is the same as bit 7 of the data input. This mode down here controls whether new flags are stored, and if so, where to get them from. I'll explain this in the schematic. I'll explain why I had to move the latching of registers to the end of the clock cycle, but first, I'll note that I'm still using a 3 to 8 decoder, even though I only need to decode 2 bits. The 138 produces active low outputs. It has three separate inputs that control whether the chip is enabled, where all have to be active for the output to be active. This is really designed so that multiple chips can be cascaded together to make a wider decoder. The output enabled G is formed of one active high input and two active low inputs. I can use these enable inputs to produce a positive edge for the latches. Sadly, the 139, a dual 2 to 4 decoder, only has one of these kinds of inputs. This is a sketch of what happens for an even register. At the top here, there is a clock cycle. Then there's a latch even input, which is active low. This G line is what I want for the decoder enable so that the output Y0 has a positive edge at the end of the clock cycle, which it does here. 
The necessary Boolean logic can be achieved by pulling G1 high, wiring the latch even to an inverting input, and the clock to the other inverting input. And here's one of two sketches for an odd register when doing the register pair increment. In this case, the carry turns out to be zero. Note that I've drawn these ambiguous values for part of the cycle. It's very important that there is no fake positive edge for the latch in this section. Here, the chip is never enabled, and the output remains high. In another earlier revision of my design, the carry being unstable may have momentarily enabled the decoder, leading to a false positive edge. I figured that this design was better. Here is what happens when the carry is set. We do get a positive edge on Y0. That fixes the problem when incrementing a register pair. When incrementing an odd register alone, I wanted to ignore the carry. Therefore, I've added another flag as an input called latch odd always. This overrides the carry. Hence, the input to the 138 is the OR of this flag and the carry. This is the only gate that I currently have on the register file, as it's something that can't be decoded outside the register file. So, I had a big argument with my programmable logic chips. Last time I showed some timing experiments. After moving the latching to the end of the cycle, I wanted to know if I could disable the GAL's output and power it down at the same time. My initial tests showed that the 574 could properly latch the result and the outputs would be disabled, provided that I used sufficient pulldowns. However, when assembled on the register file board, it's just not reliable enough and the outputs are often left enabled, which leads to unfortunate bus contention. I can see three ways to deal with this. Forget it for now, which is what I'm totally going to do. Add a delay line, which I really don't like as a solution, or use a flip-flop and an AND gate to delay the power down for a full cycle after the chip was powered on. Well, I have been able to draw up the schematics in KiCad. First off, I'm not a pro user of KiCad. I find it useful to turn the this is a sketch of the design into a what why goes where. I don't find it useful for planning breadboards. I go back to pen and paper for that. First off, these are the connectors providing inputs and outputs to the register file. KiCad likes everything to be connected to something, so this also satisfies its electrical rule checker. Then these are the two drivers that take the data input bus and split it into even and odd. I need this because the incrementers also drive these internal data buses. Here are the four even registers. Their inputs come from the even data input bus, and their outputs go to the even data output bus. As with my previous revision, there are two drivers, one to send the data to the external data output bus, and the other to an external address output. There's also the incrementer. Its output goes back into the internal even data input bus. The odd registers are pretty much identical, so I won't show those. The main new logic that I've designed is for the flags register. I'll have four processor flags, zero, carry, negative, and overflow. The ALU and the internal incrementers have to be able to write these, and the ALU and branch logic have to be able to read them. Looking at the zero flag, the value may come from any of the internal even incrementer, the odd incrementer, or external source. It's the same for the carry and the negative flags. The overflow can only come from the ALU from an add or subtract operation. There is a 139 decoder to choose between the four modes as I noted on the slide about the register files inputs. I can combine the decoder's output and the clock to get a positive edge to drive the latch input on the 574. Finally, for completeness, I've noted all the pull down resistor networks. I guess I should also add the IC decoupling capacitors too. Well, that about does it. I'm sorry I'm not as far on as I'd wanted to be, but breadboards ruin my day. I think I've squashed the major bugs. I feel a bit stupid for making these mistakes, but I did say that I'd make many mistakes on this journey. This is probably the most complex thing I've designed on a breadboard so far, and I'm pleased that I have the schematics down. Let me know if it's worth my while sharing these on GitHub. Next time, I will start on the program counter. The flags register implementation can wait I'll be on a business trip to Germany next week, so I won't be able to do anything for quite a bit. As always, thank you so much for watching. Remember that I'm not an expert, I'm just muddling through this design work. Until next time.